Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to um, day two. This morning's keynote lecture will be delivered by Andrew Hemingway. Um, Andrew is um, a this in front of me, uh, Professor Emeritus in the History of Art at University College London, where for many years been teaching, or was teaching at University College London. Many students, myself included, benefited from his knowledge and encouragement. Um, he has held visiting positions at the uh, University of Connecticut, Northwestern, and the Free University Berlin. His books include Landscape Imagery and Urban Culture in Early 19th Century Britain, Artists on the left, much used by myself, um, art, American artists and the communist movement, the mysticism, excuse me, the mysticism of money and precisionism, and a book that's just recently been uh, published called Transatlantic Romanticism, British and American Art Literature, 1790 to I have a rather loud voice anyway, so I hope I don't deafen you with the uh, amplification. Um, the focus of my paper today is Paul Strand's almost forgotten essay, La Chaise, which was published in the literary yearbook, The Second American Caravan, in 1928. For all its obscurity, it's worth attending to this text for what it illustrates about the aesthetics of the Stieglitz circle but also for the ways it exemplifies the functions of criticism for modernist groupings in the United States and elsewhere. I see Strand's thinking as representative of a broader romantic anti-capitalist Weltanschauung worldview that was quite widespread among the significant body of early 20th century American intellectuals and artists who were in recoil from American business civilization. When I use the term Weltanschauung, I use it in the fairly precise sociological sense it was developed by thinkers such as Karl Mannheim and Lucien Goldman. That is to say the term refers to a holistic view of humanity and the natural world that exceeds causal and structural explanations and forms an organic, organic totality. It's a concept that refuses to be limited by the methodological and theoretical principles of the natural sciences because it assumes that the ultimate object of knowledge to quote is the historical process as a whole, and that abstraction always tends to do violence to the concrete experiential whole. This doesn't mean that I discard the concept of ideology, with all that that implies about the role of ideas and values in the reproduction of an unequal, oppressive, and exploitative relations of social power. But it does mean that for the most part I want to suspend temporarily the critical functions of ideology critique so as to focus more on the internal coherence of a particular worldview and how it became involved in sculptural, sorry, how it became invested in sculptural form. But before doing so, it's necessary to establish some features of the Stieglitz circle and its use of criticism. In fact, the lecture has three parts, the first part being the Stieglitz circle. Historians of modernism usually regard the grouping of artists that coalesced around the person of Alfred Stieglitz, the journals he edited, and the galleries he ran as a circle, not as a movement. It resembles in this respect, say, the Stefan Georga circle in Heidelberg or the Bloomsbury group in London. Although we might see the kind of American painting with which Stieglitz became particularly associated in the 1920s, by which I mean the works of Arthur Dove, Marsden Hartley, John Marin, and George O'Keefe, as a form of American expressionism, it didn't become an ism and was not promoted as such. In any case, the Anderson Galleries, where Stieglitz organized shows from 1921 to 25, and the Intimate Gallery, which was his commercial forum from 1925 to 29, also showed works by artists working in a range of non-expressionist styles, including Charles de Muth, who was a member of the circle, 
and others who weren't, such as Peggy Bacon and Stanton MacDonald Wright. Although Stieglitz was the ideological linchpin of the circle, he was not an ideologue for the artists he supported in the way Marinetti or Kandinsky were for the artists who clustered around them. He perhaps played something like that role for the pictorialist photographers associated with him in the photo secession. And some of the statements he published in connection with that body have a manifesto-like character. But even these are brief utterances that do not position art in relation to a comprehensive worldview in the way that the more elaborate statements of Marinetti and Kandinsky do. Stieglitz disliked movements and isms, which were incompatible with the extreme individualism of his conception of artistic value. In any case, the majority of his published texts concern photography, and in most cases, in fact, they're narrowly focused on technical issues. And his published comments on even those painters he specially cared for, Marin and O'Keefe, are very scanty. Stieglitz's principal medium of written expression was the personal letter, and as probably most of you know, he left a voluminous correspondence. But the main way he disseminated his ideas was through the lengthy monologues he intoned to those visitors of the galleries who cared to listen. To judge from the accounts of Paul Rosenfeld, Dorothy Norman, and others, these took the form of personal stories and pronouncements about art and life that had an oracular quality and often seemed to have only an oblique connection with the matter at hand. Rosenfeld likened Stieglitz and his followers to a burlesque of Jesus and the disciples, while in his contribution to the 1934 volume, America and Alfred Stieglitz, a collective portrait, Harold Clerman described Stieglitz as a seer, a term Norman would adopt in the title of her 1973 book on the artist. As this may suggest, another factor that made the circle a loose formation was its anti-intellectualism, which was the counterpart to the stress on feeling and intuition in the discourse through which it achieved self-definition. The flavor of this is nicely captured in the volume Letters of John Marin, which was privately published for an American place in an edition of 400 copies in 1931. Nearly all of the letters which were written between 1910 and 1930 are addressed to Stieglitz. They are unrelievedly folksy and humorous in tone, and the same flavor permeates the small number of texts included in the volume that Marin had published previously, which appeared in camera work, manuscripts, and creative art. In fact, the most productive author writer in the Stieglitz circle was Marsden Hartley, who in 1921 published a 254-page volume with the title Adventures in the Arts, in formal chapters on painters, vaudeville, and poets, which was dedicated to Stieglitz and had an introduction by Waldo Frank. Divided into three parts, addressing respectively the visual arts, circus, vaudeville, and theater, and literature, this was mainly an anthology of Hartley's occasional writings from the Seven Arts, the Dial, and other periodicals. The 28 essays are preceded by a foreword that Hartley titled Concerning Fairy Tales and Me, and have an afterword titled The Importance of Being Dada. In the foreword, Hartley presents a kind of sketchy intellectual biography, mentioning the importance for him of what he calls magical books, by Emerson, Nietzsche, Plato, and Whitman, and describes himself as a romanticist. His main object was to affirm a childlike, magical, poetic approach to individual sensations. Implicitly, this quasi-religious outlook is set against a materialist scientific worldview, but this is not filled in. In a prefatory note, Hartley made clear that the essays in the book should be viewed as what he called entertaining conversations and that any value they had lay in their directness of impulse and not in their weight of argument. Moreover, although Hartley praised the works of DeMuth, Marin, and O'Keefe, this was only as part of his reflections on larger themes. They were not presented as members of a distinct group or aesthetic. Only Stieglitz was treated in a separate essay. So although a philosophy of art is implicit in Adventures in the, art, in the Arts, it's not articulated as a combative creed attached to a single grouping in the current scene. The Stieglitz circle needed more ideological bolster than this, I think, if it were to achieve and maintain recognition in the competitive artistic field of New York in the 1920s. 
with the publication of his essay, American Painting, in The Dial in 1921, the art and music critic Paul Rosenfeld became its Apollinaire, a position consolidated by the appearance of 14 Americans, sorry, of Portrait of New York, essays on 14 Americans three years later. In the Dial essay, while Rosenfeld praised, I should have explained what I, you were looking at, I meant to do that, I'm sorry, that's uh, Stevenson's Portrait of Strand from 1919 on the right and on, on the left, and on the right is um, a, pho <coughs> a photograph of La Chaise by Strand from 1927 to 8. This is, of course, the opening page of Rosenfeld's Portrait of New York and, and a Stieglitz portrait on him from 1923. Mm. It's not good. <coughs> in the Dial essay, while Rosenfeld praised Hartley and DeMuth alongside a varied group of contemporaries, including Arthur B. Davis, Stanton MacDonald Wright, and Man Ray, he singled out as representing a new level of integration of dream and reality in American painting, Marin, Dove, and O'Keeffe. Rosenfeld associated these artists with a spirit of protest that centered on 291, but he did not find the same quality in the works of Hartley and DeMuth. They lacked what he called the hot, fecund, powerful surge of life. As Marcia Brenner has pointed out, the heavily gendered language of Rosenfeld's evaluations indicates unmistakably that the homosexuality of Hartley and DeMuth diminished them in the Stieglitz circle value system. The same reservations are evident on Hartley in the Port of New York, where the limitations of his art are attributed to an incomplete consciousness, and DeMuth is omitted, alt omitted altogether. In addition to the artists, writers, and composer Roger H. Sessions, and the psychologist and educational theorist Margaret Naumburg, the 14 Americans in Rosenfeld's Port of New York included the cultural critics Van Wyck Brooks and Randolph Bourne, who'd been leading players in the magazine Seven Arts in 1916-17. to 17. Rosenfeld himself was also part of that group that galvanized that short-lived but seminal publication. Although, as Casey Nelson Blake has shown, the seven arts editors and contributors were not homogenous in their beliefs. The most powerful voices within it, Brooks, Bourne, Frank, and Mumford, were united in their distaste for industrial capitalism and their hope that American society might be regenerated through a kind of cultural renewal that would help to create a common cultural heritage and a vigorous community life. The fact that Rosenfeld's cultural vision was neither as critical nor as democratic as that of Brooks or Frank is symptomatic, I think, of a somewhat cloistered character of the Stieglitz Senecal at 291 Fifth Avenue and its successors. But in their deep cultural aversion to business civilization and their distance from any practical politics of social and political transformation, the Seven Arts Group and the Stieglitz Circle both exemplify the category of romantic anti-capitalism. So now I come on to part two, which is about La Chaise and the Stieglitz Circle. I want to establish to begin with how La Chaise's career trajectory, the character of his work, and the discourse within which it was framed all helped to facilitate the sculpture's entry into the charmed circle around Stieglitz. La Chaise and Stieglitz left differing accounts of their meeting, placing it, their first meeting that is, placing it in 1917 and 1918 respectively. Either way, La Chaise would have been 35 or 36 years old. He'd immigrated to the United States in January 1906, after more than a decade of training as a sculptor and craftsman in France. His motivation for leaving was by common account, his infatuation with a Boston matron, Isabelle Duteau Nagel, whom he'd met in Paris sometime between 1900 and 1903. Uh, on the left you see a photographic portrait of uh, Isabelle Nagel from uh, 1904, and on the right, a a head from 1918, which is based on her features. She was eventually divorced from her husband, and she and La Chaise married in June 1917. That she became his muse and his ideal, the focus of both his life and his art, was something he averred openly and was a matter of public record in his lifetime. La Chaise had his first... Um, I should, maybe I should 
just to bring home the point, um, Isabel Dutone Nagel liked to um, disport herself naked um, in, in nature. There's a, a photograph of her doing so from 1918. And uh, on the right, a seated woman, a bronze by uh, Lachaise of 1918, which is also based on her. Lachaise had his first major show, his solo show, at the Bourgeois Galleries at 668 Fifth Avenue in February and March 1918, where by Stieglitz's account, he and Lachaise first met. The gallery's proprietor, Stefan Bourgeois, was a German who had established a branch of his Paris art dealership in New York in 1911 and then immigrated to the United States after the outbreak of war in 1914. He began putting on shows of modern art in 1916. Like other early dealers in modernism, Bourgeois was almost necessarily an ideologue for the new tendencies, as well as a merchant. Although their terminology was somewhat different, like Stieglitz, with whom he was on friendly terms, at least between 1919 and 1923, he presented the art he championed as standing for an intuitive form of understanding that represented spiritual values in the face of the materialist civilization. For him, the key modern artist was Le Douanier Rousseau, and he particularly supported American painters who worked in seemingly naive, primitivist styles. For Le Chaise's first solo exhibition, Bourgeois provided only a list of, of works and a brief biographical resume. But for the 2nd of January, February 1920, and this is the cover of that, catalog to that show and two of the images illustrated in it, he wrote a three-page preface that initiated La Chaise's public artistic persona, his mythology, if you like. If a centerpiece of La Chaise's 1918 exhibition had been the plaster version of the standing woman on the left that Bourgeois titled Elevation, Bourgeois saw the central work of a 1920 show as love, the, the sculpture on the right, which has been lost, unfortunately, and which was displayed in a room on its own. Bourgeois presented La Chaise as representative of a new spirit that had emerged as an unintended consequence of the great hetacomb of millions. The war, Bourgeois offered, had changed something in our mentality. The presence of vast collective death had returned us to a proper understanding of our place in the universal order, made us question faith in material and scientific progress and self-satisfied individualism. And La Chaise's great achievement was in his understanding of the changing position of women. Quote, he saw and understood the evolution which womanhood was taking. Through him, woman re-entered art as a power, expressing in that way the final equality with men. He alone, that's to say La Chaise, has grasped the growing force of modern woman in all modulations of their soul. Woman has become a symbol of the great principle of life. Such a claim might seem rather hackneyed or trite, but I think it should alert us to the potential for the maternal female body to be reinvested with a new symbolic weight in the aftermath of the colossal loss of life in 1914-1918. <clears throat> Over the years 1918 to 19, Lachaise took part in at least three exhibitions of modern art at the Bourgeois Galleries including an exhibition of American sculptures held in January, February 1919, for which he provided a catalogue statement. Two points need to be noted about this. I'm showing you the bronze of the standing woman, because as this is a very important point in my argument, and um, I want you to be familiar with it. First, two points needed to be noticed about this. First, Le Chesse's assertion that the ideal in sculpture was historically contingent rooted in what he described as the faith, the effort, in the life both mental and physical of the people. It should not draw on the Greek model of ideal beauty, but on the procession of women proud in their faith, in their liberation, in the ennobling of their development that passed before the sculptor. Second, the circumstances for this new sculpture were particularly propitious in the United States. Quote, the artist coming from Europe immediately perceives that elementary form which gives him enthusiasm and expansion. The dreamer, the lover of the beautiful of the past, 
awakes to the form of a life robust and penetrating, a foundation unobscured, luminous. He becomes aware that the soil is the most, the most fertile for the continuity of art, is here, is here as capitalized. This claim to Americanness was part of Lachaise's signature, but not everyone was persuaded. For instance, the highly respected critic Henry McBride, who became one of Lachaise's most loyal and fervent supporters, observed of a 1920 Bourgeois Galleries exhibition, quote, Mr. Lachaise is more French than most French, and I never see a single one of his pieces without thinking of the Marseillaise. Lachaise's relationship with the bourgeois galleries broke down in 1921 over unpaid loans amounting to $430 that the sculptor had contracted the year before. In 1929, his relationship with Stieglitz would also come to an end over a financial misunderstanding although in this case the debacle was partly caused by Stieglitz's determination not to be regarded or treated as an art dealer. Although their breach was final, for Stieglitz, Lachaise remained, quote, America's only sculptor. Having got to know Stieglitz, Lachaise seems to have proposed making busts of him and O'Keefe, his in bronze, hers in alabaster, the bronze is of Stieglitz is, is, is lost. Um, this is a painted plaster version. And in June, Stieglitz, June 1925, Stieglitz wrote of the pleasure they both found in posing for him. To judge from Stieglitz's letters, between 1925 and 1928, he and O'Keefe were on very friendly terms with both Lachaise and Madame Lachaise. In a letter of the 2nd of May 1927, after speaking again of his pleasure in his portrait, Stieglitz affirmed his feelings for Lachaise as both a person and a worker, and hoped that someday he might reciprocate by making photographs of him in which those feelings would be expressed. In April 1928, Lachaise published a statement on his work, let's say on his own work, in the magazine Creative Art, in which he hailed Stieglitz as, quote, the man who was the first in the new world to present the work of contemporary, active European art forces, and who pointed the way to the discovery of American art values. Stieglitz, who had read the text back in May before it had appeared, had written to accept this tribute as no more than the truth, but also said, it's grand, like your mountain and so many other things of yours. The mountain refers to this sculpture, one of uh, Lachaise's most important works. This is a small Bronze, ver bronze version of it, which uh, Stieglitz uh, actually owned. But Lachaise's relationship with the Stieglitz circle extended beyond his friendship with Stieglitz and O'Keefe. In 1923, de Lachaise bought a house at Georgetown, oops, on Georgetown Island in southern Maine, not far from Portland. They spent lavishly on the decor, furnishings, and garden and the couple were warmly hospitable. Paul Strand begins to mention his and Rebecca Strand's stays, uh, visits to Georgetown in letters to Stieglitz from 1925. I quote, Beck has written how much we enjoyed La Chaise and Madame, whose attentiveness and acquaintance with the island made our own enjoyment of it keener, he wrote on 4th of September. Now the coast of Maine held a particular appeal to both Hartley and Marin, who also visited with the Lachaise. In 1928, Lachaise made a fine, fine portrait bust of Marin, which you see on, on the left, and um, on the right, one of uh, uh, Marin's watercolors of, of Maine made um, on, on the visit to the Lachaise in 1928. <clears throat> to judge from surviving letters, Hartley's friendship with Isabel, with Isabel Lachaise was particularly close. And there's a large correspondence written to her after Lachaise's death in 1935, which goes on until Hartley's death. If Arthur Dove was not among the guests, he was no less an enthusiast for Lachaise's work. But the Strand's relations with the Lachaise's were particularly close, and Isabel Lachaise seems to have played a crucial role in this four-way friendship. Correspondence between both, both Strand's and Madame Lachaise lasted until the latter's death in 1956, and their letters are full of expressions of friendship and endearments, of love 
in Rebecca Strand's case. Rebecca Strand and Isabella Chez used to exchange valentines. In later years especially, both Rebecca and Paul would refer to the importance of their Georgetown memories, and especially the summers of 1927 and 1928, when Hartley had also been there, and which seemed to have been particularly magical. The Strands bought La Chaise's small bronze walking woman, another piece based on Isabel, and a small torso on the right, which Rebecca acquired in 1938, remained one of her most treasured possessions. In a letter to a museum director written four years after La Chaise's death, Strand described him as the greatest of American sculptors. He'd made several photographs of La Chaise and his works, and it's a Strand portrait that provided the frontispiece of the catalogue to the 1935 La Chaise retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Thus, as things turned out, it was Strand who made photographs of La Chaise and his work, not Stieglitz. La Chaise seems to have reciprocated in his enthusiasm for Strand's art. He provided a brief catalogue statement for Strand's 1929 exhibition at the Intimate Gallery, in which he wrote in what would now be a familiar, should now be a familiar vein, Paul Strand's photographs are powerful, personal, spiritual, decisively American contributions within the maelstrom of American materialism, which project far beyond mere mechanical exactitude. In fact, 23 of the 32 photographs on display had been made at Georgetown, and a further four had main themes. Strand would use several of the Georgetown photographs in his great 1950 photo book, Time in New England. In 1921 or 1922, La Chaise had switched from bourgeois to the more prestigious C.W. Kraushaar Gallery, and his star was on the rise, partly because of his contacts with the group of Harvard graduates who edited or contributed to the Dial magazine, one of the most prestigious organs of American literary modernism, which carried favorable reviews of his work by E.E. E. Cummings, Henry McBride, and Paul Rosenfeld, as well as numerous reproductions of his sculptures and drawings. It was in these circumstances that he asked Stieglitz for a show at the Intimate Gallery, to which Stieglitz assented while warning him that the nature of the gallery might limit the financial advantages of an exhibition. In the event, actually, La Chaise seems to have done rather well out of it. La Chaise became briefly the unnamed number seven, which was added to the roster of the six Stieglitz artists. This is a flyer for um, uh, La Chaise's show. When the Intimate Gallery showed 20 of his works in a solo display in March, April 1927, Gerald Nordland has written, it was an unspoken understanding that La Chaise should not expect to become a member of the inner circle of the intimate gallery, despite his relationship with Stieglitz as a favored host. I'm not sure what the evidence is for this claim, but perhaps this is what Isabelle La Chaise had told him. However, it's true that Stieglitz, who always insisted that he was no art dealer, was in no position to become one for La Chaise. The conditions of professional practice in sculpture are very different from those in modernist painting and photography, and particularly so for, what, for one with La Chaise's ambitions as a public sculptor. Materials and workshop space require much greater outlay than for photographs, watercolors, and modest-sized oil paintings. Correspondingly, La Chaise worked far more with the traditional pattern of patronal relations than as a free agent in the market something that is illustrated by his remarkable production of portrait busts, which was certainly driven in part by financial need. In the long history of Stieglitz's gallery ventures, he put on only three other exhibitions of sculpture, those of Matisse in 1912, Brancusi in 1914, and Nadelman in 1915 to 16. In other words, they were all at 291. In 1927, while he was mounting La Chaise's show, Stieglitz told Harold Seligman that it was probably the last sculpture show he would put on, and in fact it was. Okay, now I finally turn to Strand's essay. The publication of Strand's essay on La Chaise took place in a context defined by the larger Stieglitz circle. In 1925, Rosenfeld and Stieglitz were passing the summer at the Stieglitz family's summer retreat at Lake George, where they had long nightly discussions about the state of American literature and art with Alfred Kreinborg, the modernist poet, novelist, and editor. 
Kreinborg suggested that he and Rosenfeld start a literary yearbook with an editorial team that would also include Van White Brooks and Lewis Mumford. In the end, um, Van White Brooks wasn't part of it, but the other two were. The first volume of The American Caravan appeared in 1927 and was dedicated to Stieglitz. Four more would eventually be published intermittently until 1936. Strand's La Chaise appears in the second. Strand's essay is structured round an extended contrast between the sculpture of America and the sculpture of Europe, which is also a contrast between the cultures of the two continents. This dichotomy is heavily indebted to articles by Waldo Frank recently published in The New Republic, from which Strand quotes. Strand's connections to Frank and the Seven Arts Group were close. He published his first statement on art in the magazine in 1917. In 1921, he cited the writings of Frank along with those of Brooks and Mumford as models of contemporary criticism. And in a letter to the New Republic in 1928, he acknowledged the importance to him of Frank's influential cultural critique of 1919, Our America. The central premise of Frank's essays, which were published in book form as the Rediscovery of America in 1929, is a human imperative towards wholeness. Quote, Wholeness is no mere desired goal. It's the origin and end of all our creative being. Wholeness must be both personal and social in order to be either. Individual man cannot have achieved his health unless he live consciously within a whole that holds all life, end quote. For Frank, the epitome of such a holistic culture was medieval Christendom, and its symbol was the Mediterranean, around which a whole range of cultures fused into what he called a single conceptual body. This culture was now dying because it no longer had the universal unifying belief system that religion had provided. But it, it remained vital, but its vitality was that of a festering corpse. As it dies, the old world of the Mediterranean runs into the new world of the Atlantic. But while the Mediterranean is bounded, the Atlantic is boundless. America, for Frank, is the grave for the Mediterranean culture. It is the place where the sense of a whole disintegrates. Frank's conception of the Atlantic world might seem to offer little basis for cultural optimism. He described American life as a jungle, because when European man was released from the whole, he reverted to savagery. America was merely a herd longing to become a society. In the New World, man was driven by, a wi by will and an impulse to action, so that, quote, American life is a constant agitation, a violent moving hither and beyond in a society that has turned the machine into an idol. The reign of the machine is the reign of power, and power is also inimical to the whole. The machine and the reign of power both render the individual passive. The antithesis of this power is love, and it is love that is, is the creative force. Quote, a mass of power persons cannot integrate, can form, form no organ of true society, they make the herd whose sum is the accumulation of self-assertive atoms. In a true society, love finds its natural career. Such a society is nubile, is a, such a society is nubile intricately living whole, with which the individual wills may marry through social, political, aesthetic, and religious action. With us who are a herd, the impulse to create is disembodied. Yet America longs for what it appears to reject. For Frank, the skyscraper is the symbol of American power, but like the popular arts that appeal to Americans at large, its principles are, quote, antithetical to the true aesthetic function. The true Americans are those tragic figures who, quote, make the plastic form of their, their vision from the plasmic substance of their experience by what he calls the apocalyptic method. And these include, above all, Stieglitz but also Isadora Duncan, Arthur Dove, Georgia O'Keeffe, Marsden Hartley, John Marin, William Carlos Williams, Hart Crane, Eugene O'Neill, and Gaston Lachaise, amongst others. For Strand, every form of Lachaise's vision, quote, is evidence that when Lachaise came to America 20 years ago, his was a voyage in the Atlantic in the symbolic sense Mr. Frank has given it, end quote. Thus, Strand thinks within the same conceptual parameters and, in fact, speaks the same vitalist language as Frank. Thus, for him, 
La Chaise is not merely one of the most distinguished sculptors of our time. His sculptures bear in their active surging forms a distinct expressive imprint of the force called America. That is, they project that same vitality which seethes, however barbarously in this American world and has not decayed into dead husks of nymphs and phonographic prettiness, nor those obverse forms, grandiose and doughy, of vitality gone impotent. Strand may well have been referring to the sculptures of Edward McCartan, this is McCartan's Nymph and Satyr of 1920 on the left, and Paul Manship, the Manship's Theseus, Theseus and Ariadne of 1927-8 for the estate at Harbour Hill, Long Island on the right. Lachez had, in fact, worked as an assistant for Manship for a number of years from 1913 to support himself while he developed his own sculptural practice. So while the American environment of what Strand calls mechanized industrialism is hostile to the immigrant Lachez, Strand imagines the impact of its hurly-burly, its tremendous tempo on Lachez's sensitive temperament. He, let's say Lachez, accepted its hostility as a challenge and saw it as preferable to the friendlier quietude of the old world, which was, to quote, only a crust beneath which energies once healthy were sick, ready for the fratricide that came later in 1914. The American fabric is barbarous but healthier. Within the chaos of American life, La Chaise had perceived a naked vitality. In, La Chaise's, in, sorry, in Strand's telling, La Chaise mastered his craft in the same way that he'd argued in the 1922 essay, Stieglitz had mastered the photographic machine, so that it became, quote, an instrument of a sensitive, powerful affirmation of human life. In this sculptural statement, there is a continued recognition of the immense inhuman energy at work in America, without a single cheap or dishonest concession to its deftly but seductive insistence upon standardized herd forms of action, feeling, and thinking. This immense inhuman energy, this rampant vital force, is absent from modern European sculpture, even at its best, in Lanebrook, Brancusi, Mayol, and Despio. La Chaise's artistic will inevitably takes a phallic form, quote, a central column of intense being and seeing into which his affirmation solidifies. And it focuses corres correspondingly on the body of woman, a central symbol whose amplitude is flowering. That's Strand, not me. Strand lists in particular the mountain which I showed you, the striding woman which you've also seen, standing woman and floating figure which we'll see at the end. Upon this epic symbol, Strand wrote, La Chaise has projected an immense human inclusive inclusiveness and love wherein healthy primitive force has been subjected to the complicated leavening of civilized mental and sensory development. To carry the point... La Chaise's treatment of woman... Whoops, that's not the right one, is it? La Chaise's treatment of w woman had to be differentiated from that of Lanebrook and Mayol, the representatives of northern and southern Europe, of Gothic and classical form respectively, although Strand does not spell out those differences. Lanebrook, who La Chaise regarded as one of the greatest sculptors of his time, had been represented at the armory show by his famous attenuated female figure, Nienda, on the left, as well as, in fact, by a more conventionally proportioned standing woman of 1910. For Strand, nothing could be, quote, more antithetical in the basis of its cosmic vision and response to La Chaise's work than this. Lanebrook's slender women display, quote, an almost unbearable sensitiveness, attenuated and neurasthenic, ghastly beautiful. They seem almost prophetic of the war and express the decayed fabric of European culture. La Chaise's monumental matrons, which many contemporary critics complained were fat, obese, or simply ugly, spoke of an elemental force and rude barbaric health characteristic of America. But the health of La Chaise's figures also had to be distinguished from what Strand called the peasant health of Mayol, whose torso, so often, torsos so often arbitrarily truncated, seemed relatively stolid, as though the body, for all its frequent soil-like richness, was mindless, not complete even in its basic connection with life, end quote. By contrast, while the complex growth in La Chaise's body was rooted in earth, American mm -hmm. earth that is, they suggested a 
culturally individualized mind and consciousness. In addition to six drawings, Mayall was been represented at the Armory Show by a terracotta bar relief, which you see on the left, and a terracotta femme de boue. The latter was the figure that had inaugurated Mayall's reputation at the Salon d'Automne in 1905, where it was shown under the simple title Femme. It was later renamed the Mediterranean, and when it was illustrated on the cover of the Arts Magazine in 1924, it was titled The Mediterranean Sea. Thanks in large part to the 1925 Mile exhibition in Buffalo, which traveled to 11 North American cities in 1925 to 7, Mile was probably the best known and highly regarded modern French sculptor in the United States, and the Mediterranean was his most famous work. In 1923, the French state commissioned a version in marble. It exemplifies the stockiness and passivity of so many of Mile's sculptures, and that for Strand expressed the contrast between the cultures of Europe and America. If Strand was familiar with the French literature on Mile, and his French, or at least his spoken French, was poor at this stage, he would have known that it made much of his birth on the Mediterranean coast at Bagnols-sur-Mer, and his rootedness in the landscape of the region. This allegedly explained both the classicism and the Frenchness of his work. In any case, given that Strand posited the Americanness of Lachaise's sculpture precisely in terms of Frank's Mediterranean-Atlantic dichotomy, one might have expected Mayol to be the primary exemplar of the former. His work was the epitome of a modernized classicism and putative Frenchness. But instead, Strand focused more on Charles Despio, who had had his first solo exhibition at the Brummer Gallery in November, December 1927, and whose work was suddenly a fashionable success in New York, being promoted by the critic Forbes Watson in the Arts Magazine, and also in Vanity Fair, whose editor Frank Crowninshield owned a substantial number of Despio's works. Despio's Eve, which you see on the left, had for Strand an innocent loveliness, but it was also innocent of the contemporary struggle, and this made its tenor intrinsically memorial. It is untouched by any sense of the complex forces set so violently in motion by scientific thought, current which have com currents which have compelled the evolution of the more complicated but disrupted psyche of the city, whose vitality creates and dominates in the modern machine age. By contrast, in Lachaise's Standing Woman, quote, the back and the abdomen are a tremendous multiform flowering from the slender living stems of the legs. It is human body and spirit arrived at an ecstatic consciousness of power over the external internal forces for which it has been a challenge. The extraordinary tiptoes pose, the sense of precarious balance and imminent movement contrasts with the stolid pose and rootedness, the downcast passivity of Despio's Eve. The modern sculptor who was best known for his engagement with machine-like shapes and surfaces was, of course, Brancusi. Not only had Brancusi had his first exhibition in the US at 291 in 1914, he'd recently had a comprehensive exhibition at the Brummer Gallery in November, December 1926, which showcased some of his most radical works. This is Mademoiselle Pogeny, version two from 1925. Lachaise acknowledged his admiration for Brancusi's sculpture, and one can find admiration, uh, confirmation of this quite clearly in some of the earlier heads and small polished bronze figures. Strand admitted, there can be little question that Brancusi, more than any other contemporary, has been an important influence in Lachaise's growth, one which he's absorbed creatively. But he emphasized that Brancusi was, quote, a peasant who lived an isolated existence like a hermit in the midst of Paris. His sculptures suggested, quote, a world almost primordial in which people scarcely exist, except as a reminder of the aboriginal emanations that flow from the life in stone and metal and wood. They seem to be either atavistic or prophetic. But while they had made Lachaise more aware of the primal life in materials, their purity of form made them unsuited for the extreme pressure of living in the American hive. Consistent with this positive evaluation of Lachaise's more traditional representation of the human body, Strand was perhaps more ready than most critics to accord importance to Lachaise's large output of portrait busts, despite the financial imperatives that drove the production of most of them. This was perhaps in part because of the importance of the portrait in the Stieglitz circle. The genre had always played an important role 
in pictorialist photographic practice, but its importance was heightened with what has been described as the serial portrait of O'Keefe Stieglitz began to exhibit at the Anderson Galleries in his comeback exhibition in 1921. One might compare the role of O'Keefe as muse to Stieglitz with the role of Isabel Duto Nagel in La Chaise's life, although Nagel was not an accomplished artist. Despite the fact she rarely sat for him, she seems to have been the bodily type that formed what was effectively new in his American ideal of bodily form. Against what he saw as the objective character of Lachaise's portraits, Strand counterposed the subjectivism of those of Epstein and Despio. According to Strand, in both cases, the personality of the sculptor overwhelmed that of a sitter. Um, Epstein's bust of Jacob Kramer on the right, and um, Despio's bust of uh, Madame Otton Fries on the left. In Epstein's work, this was a tortured self, while in Despio, it was a deep, secluded being representing his own internal wholeness and, and purity. By contrast, the objective reality so sharply individualized in Lachaise's portraits derives from another cosmos, this again is Strand, not me, one no longer part of the cultural whole that is Europe. It is the reality of people caught in and marked by combat with the vast tidal forces of the mid-Atlantic. The variety of media and technique in Lachaise's portraits were evidence of the finesse of his sensibility, his receptiveness to all the individual differences amongst those he sculpted. Deploying the organicist rhetoric he shared with Frank, Strand claimed that for Lachaise, a portrait is a sculptural totality. It is a formulation of human wholeness as a stem for vital force to flow through. Although these personalities were marked by the experience of living in America with its aura of chaos, Lachaise's own will brought out the creative elements in the individual personality and gave them an abstract wholeness through sculptural form. I can only show you two of um, Lachaise's uh, busts here, the one of Schofield Thayer in bronze on the uh, right and uh, the one of Anna uh, Kraushaar uh, in marble on the left. Okay, I'm at the end, almost. So, I want to finish with two points. First, it might seem as though the discourse of Frank and Strand, with which Lachaise evidently identified, was little more than a species of romantic speculation on cultural difference that is not amenable to verification, but is little removed from the poisonous fusion of land, race, and culture that was the common currency of fascist ideology. But to look at it like this would be, I think, to misjudge it. In fact, both Frank and Strand became active anti-fascists and indeed communist fellow travelers in the 1930s. While Frank is little studied today, in the interwar years he was regarded as a major intellectual. Widely read and well-traveled, he was a prolific novelist and a respected political and cultural critic. Although we might see the books he wrote on Spain, Russia, and Latin America as more cultural journalism than cultural history, which he thought they were, they're in fact an odd mix of insight, crude anthropologizing, and mystical longings. Today, his vast cultural generalizations are usually associated with objectionable stereotypes, and his use of the terms race and people seem inherently problematic. But Frank was careful to distinguish his notion of race from, quote, something absolute of the blood and of the physical structure. He saw it rather as the focus of what sea and rain and foe and food have worked within the flesh of a people and its separatistic self-consciousness its primitive desire to be autonomous and alone. In fact, what he projected was something more akin to what we now call multiculturalism. Against the uniform people, his term, the unconscious people enslaved to the monotony of industrial advance that was the product of American business civilization, Frank projected a conscious people, a varied and integral people, the symphonic nation in whom all selves and all visions adumbrate to wholeness. It was on the basis of such a conception that he could claim the child of German Jewish immigrants as America's premier cultural leader, or the work of an immigrant French sculptor who'd been in the country little more than 20 years as one of the foremost exemplars of what was most truly American in American art. My second point is this. The fact that La Chaise became the favorite sculpture of the Stieglitz Circle was not a question of mere contingencies, of meanings attaching to an empty signifier. <coughs> 
There was a genuine ideological and formal match between his ideas and works and their Weltanschauung. Like them, Lachaise practiced a kind of what Adorno would call moderate modernism. He made very little engagement with the great isms of Cubism and Surrealism. Like more traditionalist modernist sculptures, his most ambitious work involved an attempt to rethink the ideal human form in modernist terms. It's to his credit that he took this search in more radical and unsettling directions than most modernists who followed this path, certainly than Maya, I'll say. This is um, uh, Lachaise's Floating Woman of uh, 1927. He severely attenuated and sometimes jettisoned references to, to the classical canon. In this context, this could stand for a kind of distancing from Europe. The fact that his most daring experiments with the body were realized in the female form also made his art cognate with that of a Stieglitz circle because of the central importance of a highly sexualized imagery in the work of the group's core members. Strand's 1928 essay inducted Lachaise into the discourse of a Stieglitz circle, but it could do so because in the circumstances, form and ideas, Weltanschauung could be felt, his, in the circumstances, his form and ideas, his Weltanschauung could be felt to belong in a common whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it reminded me again what you said about Waldo Frank, that the Stieglitz circle is actually much more coherent than one might have assumed. Uh, I think if you read his work, um, which he seems totally inaccessible to us today because of its rhetoric, but at the same time is preparatory for m many things that are picked up in the 70s again with a different rhetoric, with a different language. So I think Walter Frank is actually one of the most important figures of, of that time, trying to extend Stieglitz's and uh, overcome Stieglitz's uh, disaffection with commercial and machine life, uh, constantly working to integrate the machine into consciousness like in the American jungle, mm -hmm. where he added a special chapter on how to integrate the machine into, every, into consciousness. And that is exactly what Hart Crane did in The Bridge, so that these ideas which seem so obscure and uh, actually very dubious today uh, have a lot of ramifications and echo in all these different works, even in Williams, in The American Grain. So all they would insist on their individual difference, mm -hmm. they're nevertheless coherent in their shared assumption of wholeness or uh, Wholeness is, of course, very difficult because Williams has a, is concerned with particularity, and yet behind that particularity, there's also an attempt to create something that hangs together, that is held together by the creative impulse or by love or whatever you want to call it. So I found your talk very illuminating, and I realize I don't have a question. I made another. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was trying to work out what you were saying. Yeah, I disagreed sorry, with what I said, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> it was an appreciation. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you about the uh, importance of Frank, obviously. And I, I think that uh, actually our, our America is a rather wonderful book. Um, it, it, it's better because it's a little bit more direct and more focused, I think, than The Reawakening of America. This may be total, totally off, uh, too digressive, but since you come from an English background, is there any connection with Gogia Brzeska? Gogia Brzeska? And um, Pound, for that matter. No, <laughs> he's, n he's not referred to in any uh, sculpt discussion of, of sculpture in the United States that I've come across. Not that I'm a, a, you know, I'm not a historian of American sculpture. I'm interested in Strand, is, is, is really here. Yeah. 
but uh, I'm not aware of any references to Gaudi or Bershka. I don't, I don't think he's, I mean, I mean, um, there is an American edition of H.S. Eder's Savage Messiah, so his yes. work clearly was known here. And popular. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I have not come across any references to it. No. This is curious. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hi. Well, thanks for this, because it was quite enlightening also in terms of the sort of perceptions of Europe by Americans and the sort of transatlantic dialogue. But this sort of, you know, idea of Europe, you know, which, you know, was deeply problematic, sort of fuzzy, messy, reductive, uh, is, um, you know, this sort of, you know, romantic anti-capitalism, you know, uh, is quite unlike the uh, sort of anti-capitalism of the romantics themselves who were quite aware of sort of, you know, historical and political contingencies while they were writing. So, you know, couldn't you see that sort of, you know, more critically as well in the sense that, you know, sort of crude anthropologizing, whereas, uh, and not really a sort of, you know, anticipation of multiculturalism, because, you know, multiculturalism is something that we, you know, uh, we want to think of as sort of, you know, more attentive, sort of aware of, uh, real sort of, you know, histories and politics, you know, the sort of, you know, shift from Europe, both as sort of holistic whole sort of vision and decay, and, you know, lumping the Mediterranean together with classical Greece and France, is just way too uh, misguided, in a sense. So, well, I don't know, you know, and whether that creates problems in terms of the politics of those texts, you know, well-intentioned as they were. Firstly, um, to you know, show my colours, I'm a huge admirer of um, Mikhail Lerder's and Robert Sayre's work on Romanticism. I don't know if you know, it's published in English as Romanticism Against the Tide of Modernity, and in French as the Romanticism of Contre Courant. And uh, it's also related to a, a group of a number of articles which um, Lerder's published over the last 30 years, and which argues of the um, centrality of uh, romanticism to any worthwhile cultural critique, essentially. And I, I do think that, you know, th they argue for this long tradition of romanticism which stretches from the late 18th century up till the present and, and is, is recurrent, you know, and takes, takes different forms. And uh, the, the, the suggestion is not, of course, that romanticism is uh, necessarily a, 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 an attitude, a kind of anti-capitalism which associates with the left. I mean, it, 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 there's just as many associations with the right, you know, uh, there's just as, you know, there's Charles Morat and Action Francaise, or there's Thomas Carlyle in, 18th, in 19th century Britain, and, and so on. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question, I think, of rather of, um, uh, and which why I emphasize this, this notion of wholeness, a, a question of a sort of totalizing thinking. And in relation to that, you know, I'm, I'm with Marcuse, the whole is true, the whole is false. real politics of the uh, sort of traditions they were sort of engaging with, the other traditions. Whereas, you know, this, you know, we talk about the 1910s and the 1920s, and the, well, Europe and the Mediterranean was actually, you know, the scene of exchange of populations, you know, all kinds of wars, shifting borders. So, you know, that sort of, you know, a historical reductivism and sort of, you know, lumping of is, I mean, I see the intentions and I see, you know, how important it is to shape a view of the uh, contemporary U.S. But nonetheless, it's kind of, you know, strikingly uh, sort of crude in terms of what it draws on. Yes, I, I mean, as I, as I say, it would be better to describe it as cultural journalism than to call it cultural history. And I, but I, to say, you know, to, to come back in relation to that, in a, in a society where, um, you know, it's published at a time when there's a new upsurge in lynching in the South, in, in a society in which um, the Stieglitz family in the 1880s had been unable to stay in their favorite hotel in Saratoga Springs because it didn't admit Jews. You know, there is a certain value to his kind of willingness to have a syncretic vision. I think his vision is utopian, you know, and 
Yeah, and absolutely. That's the big too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one should be careful, you know, in terms of talking about kinds of nationalism. I don't, I mean, this is not a drum beating, my country right or wrong kind of natural, nationalism. Thank God. Yeah. yeah, I just had a very simple question, but um, there seems to be something going on with the medium itself. I mean, the sculpture, what could sculpture could do versus photography versus painting and something that you did not really bring in but is do you think it is is there something about that uh yeah i think there is absolutely yeah um i think um I interestingly um and let's get something i couldn't touch on um in many ways la Chaise, um remains more a, a modeler than a carver although la taille direct was important to him as a, a reference point he, he, he's not really known for his he's known for his bronzes more than for his his, his, his carvings and uh, some of the some of the later works are, are surprisingly Rodin-esque really and of course he remains also very involved with the fragment which Rodin had done so much to um, so he doesn't he doesn't have the kind of um, how shall I put it anti-Rodinism uh, which was associated with some of the the French sculpture of the period, like the sculpture of Maillot in particular, you know, I mean, where, you know, Maurice Denis, Maillot, one of Maillot's great defenders, sort of dismisses Rodin as a kind of, you know, misadventure in sculpture, basically. Um, so, no, I do think there is something about medium there as well. But it's, I, and I didn't develop it because I wanted to talk about other things. So it's just because, um, I mean, it, photography quickly associated with modernity, of course. And then painting, I mean, the, some yeah. of those, the doves and, uh, that you're mentioning, they were so interested in, in translating certain sensations through the, the new media of sound, radio, and so uh, in a way, uh, sculpture has been missing in that kind mm. of uh, mm. situation, and it, uh, or sketching of the situation. So it's interesting to, to bring it in. Well, I, th I think he certainly um, does uh, take something from Brancusi, particularly those highly polished bronze sculptures, there is a kind of real machine age feel to some of those. They, ha they also have rather the, the feel of little, you know, small art deco um, room decorations, which isn't to disparage them. I, I, I didn't mean that to sound dismissive. I mean, you know, I think, I think they're, they're rather interesting, actually. Um, yeah. 